Hey guys, it's Sandro here and welcome to part two in the pain correction stage of the detail on this 10 year old Mitsubishi Pajero Bush Basher. Now I hope you've seen part one as I'm going to jump straight into part two by doing some test sections to see what combination of compound pad and technique I'm going to use to correct this paint. For a first test I'm using the Lake Country Blue STO Foam Light Cutting Pad and NV Finesse Polish on the Rupes Millie Polisher. I'm on speed four using moderate pressure with a slowish arm movement and doing three passes in a half metre size section. Now although finesse polish is a fine finishing polish it does have a bit of bite to start with and although the Lake Country Blue STO pad is more of an intermediate to light cutting pad its increased stiffness does transmit quite a bit of cutting power to the paint. So although this is still a relatively gentle combination and technique if the paint is super soft it still has the potential to work quite well. But based on all the severe defects in the paint, I was still a little skeptical that it would be aggressive enough to get the result I was after. Now as far as the holograms are concerned they've all been removed and like I mentioned in part one that's really all the owner wanted done and the gloss clarity and saturation levels of the paint have also been significantly improved so I guess I'm done right? Wrong. As a professional detailer you have to balance what your customers ask for together with your own experience judgment. That's why they come to you. So although this is what the customer asked for, it's not a result I'm going to deliver as it's not reflective of a professional job and not something I'm going to put my name to. So I still need more defect removal to achieve at least a reasonable and professional outcome. For a second test, I stuck with finesse polish, but this time used it on the Rupes Yellow Medium Wall Pad to increase its cutting ability. I prime the pad to start with as these refined wool pads don't self prime as well as foam pads. Used a little more product on the pad and just slightly increased my machine speed and pressure to extract a little more cut out of this section. As we have a look at the results this was by far a better outcome. I'd say I removed about 70% of the defects compared to the last section which was more like 40 to 50%. Now in the last section the gloss and clarity levels were actually almost perfect. While although they are still good in this section I can still see a touch of haze in the finish. Now as I mentioned in part one this is not going to be a high end paint correction job but based on time and the owner's budget. So although I'm not 100% happy with the results here it's still a huge improvement and potentially a good way to go in balancing defect removal, gloss levels, time and cost but I still want to explore more options at this point. For a third test section I stuck with the Rippers yellow wool pad but this time used it with Shoal Concepts S20 Black to further increase its cutting ability and my technique and method was identical to the previous section. 
Now as far as defect removal, this was pretty much what I was aiming for in my head, which was a good 80% plus removal of the existing defects. I could however see that there was just a touch more haze in the finish, meaning that as I'm slowly getting better defect removal, I'm also starting to slowly get not quite as good a finish. Now the haze in this section isn't terrible by any means, more so right on the edge of what I consider to be acceptable for a quicker one step correction process. So the question here becomes, do I go for a little more defect removal and live with a little more haze, or do I forgo that extra defect removal and go for a slightly better finish? The truth is, I wasn't sure and I still wanted to explore more options. For a fourth combination, I switched back to the Lake Country Blue SDO foam pad, which seemed to be finishing better on this paint, but this time tried it with NV Precision Cutting Compound, which certainly has more cut than the previous compounds, but can still finish surprisingly well. I also want to add here that the extra testing you're going to see from this point on wasn't added to the time or budget of this job. I really just did it because I know this testing is helpful to a lot of you detailers and enthusiasts starting out in paint correction to understand how different paints and combinations affect results and how to judge them. Now as we have a look at the results, I can definitely say that cut wise, this was actually the best so far, being a touch better than the last section, but finish wise, it also had a bit more haze and compounding swirls than the last section. So for a one step correction process, which is definitely all the time I have for this job, the haze in the finish here just crossed over that line of being acceptable to my eyes. So what does this tell me about this paint? I can say pretty confidently that it's a softer paint, as apart from the quite severe defects, most of which have gone through the clear coat, the rest of them are coming out without too much aggression needed. And although I wouldn't say this is a super soft paint as I'm still able to finish reasonably well without too much heartache, it's definitely on the softer side as I know from past experience that this combination can finish perfectly on many hard to medium paints. For a fifth test section, I stuck with the same pad but this time used it with Shoal S2 Black. Nest 2 Black is an extra heavy cutting compound, but in my experience, it can still finish surprisingly well. And although it usually doesn't finish quite as good as MV Precision, sometimes it's just about what the specific paint likes and responds best to. Now so far, out of all these tests, this was the best defect removal I was able to achieve, getting up towards that high-end 95% plus defect-free result. So if I was pursuing a two stage higher end correction, this could certainly be a winning cutting stage combination. But when I look at the finish, I can see more haze here and some increased micro marring compared to all the other sections. One last test I wanted to do was using Envy Finesse on a medium microfiber pad. So Finesse has by far finished the best on this paint. And there's no denying that microfiber pads do generally offer great cutting abilities with reasonable finishing qualities. Now unfortunately, this combination was a bit of a miss on this paint. The cutting ability, though reasonable, wasn't all that great compared to the last couple of sections, and the finish was actually the worst one so far. I actually use microfiber pads a lot on medium to harder paints as they can be so efficient and effective on both free spinning and gear driven DA polishes. But I want to do this last test just to show that especially in a one stage correction process on softer paints, the increased heat microfiber generates doesn't tend to make them a great choice in this particular case on more heat sensitive softer car paints. So after all this testing, what were my conclusions? Well, in a one step process, I'm just not gonna get any heavy cutting compounds finishing well enough on this paint. And in order to achieve enough cut with a finer to medium compound, I need a good finishing fiber or wool pad to get there and find that vital balance. In the end, my real choice was, do I pursue a slightly better finish with finesse or do I pursue more defect removal with S20? both on the Rupes yellow wool pads. To help me out with that decision, I did do a couple more test sections with these two compounds on different panels and also to confirm these results on the rest of the car's paint. 
This ended up being extremely helpful in making that decision. As although Finesse did finish a touch better, the extra cutting ability I was getting from S20 seemed to be a greater factor in this particular case to achieve the best overall finish in a one stage correction process. All in all guys, this softer paint with these severe defects just isn't a great candidate for a one stage correction process. So ideally, given that extra time and budget, a two stage correction process here would just be so much better in achieving the best result. But in the real world with time and cost limitations, we just have to do the best we can within these circumstances. So I'll just let the footage run while I finish off the bonnet and then we'll have a look at the results. I won't lie, it was a decent amount of work just correcting this monster sized bonnet. The results were by no means what I consider to be a high end result. There was a mild amount of haze in the finish and quite a few deeper scratches and edgings that didn't entirely come out. But all in all guys, it was an absolutely huge improvement and at the very least an 80% improvement compared to what the paint was like to start with that I was quite happy with given the restrictions of this job. I'll also add that I don't think it even dawned on me that this was a metallic paint until I stopped and took a step back to admire the little glistening particles and reflections in the finish. Now as I get down to business and continue correcting the rest of the paint, I just want to discuss a few more points. You saw that I displayed on screen the amount of sections I did on the bonnet, which ended up being 14 polishing sections in total. I explained in part 1 how I broke down this job time wise, which included allocating 12 hours to paint correction alone. If you start doing some calculations on how many potential sections you'll have to do on this whole vehicle, and that an average polishing set is just under 2 minutes, you'll probably come up with something like 3 hours or even less to correct this whole car, and certainly nothing like 12 hours which is what I ended up spending in the end. 
So where does all this extra time go? Or why does it end up taking so long? Am I just sitting down drinking coffees all day? That would be nice, but no. What you don't always see and would just make these videos way too long and boring is that there's a lot of other steps and factors that eat up time during every single job. Some are predictable while others are a bit more random. So the predictable factors are things like blowing out pads after every set, swapping out and rotating pads, adding product and priming pads, and obviously things like wiping off compound residue and additional IPA wipe downs. You can also then add a quality control aspect where I inspect my results and inevitably there's always a few sections that I'll do some extra additional spot correction work. Maybe it's going over a defect that needs an extra set of passes or maybe it's to address an area where the finish or clarity isn't as good as it should be. Add to that that certain trims can have varied paints and clear coats which means more testing and adjustments on the fly and little mishaps happen like product splatter that needs cleaning up and sometimes inflicting wiping swirls that need to be repolished and all that adds up in the end. What this really means is that you have to take something like a two minute polishing set and really double if not triple and quadruple it to get a realistic time frame of the speed in which you can work in to factor in these things and still produce a quality result. Let me tell you a little story. A couple of months ago, I decided to build a garden shed from scratch because my garage space was becoming cluttered with all the gardening equipment I had to get to maintain the lawn and property. Now, I'm no experienced builder or anything like that, but I'm okay with my hands and I thought, yeah, no problem. I'll knock it out in my free time over a weekend or two. Two months later, I've just finished it. From getting the wall bearing stumps level in the ground to stupidly buying dodgy wonky wood to building barn doors that didn't sit straight against the wonky wood to getting flimsy roof sheeting that bowed down under rainwater, it was just an epic journey building this thing with challenges at every stage. Now I got it done in the end and it's now sitting strong and solid but it took me four times as long and cost me four times as much as I had predicted at the start. I'm not a builder and I've never built a garden shed, so I cut myself some slack. But I am an experienced detailer, which is why I can predict to a much greater level the challenges I'll be facing, the time I'll be needing and the cost I'll be incurring, which is something I have acquired through experience. So I guess the moral of the story is that you can make your own assumptions and do your own research as to how long something should take and how much it should cost. But until you actually get down and dirty and do it yourself, you'll never really appreciate all the obstacles, challenges and the skill set and experience that a good professional in their respective trade understands and brings to the table. I mean, I can build you a garden shed if you like, but I think you'd much rather have me detailing your car.
Now, one thing you may have picked up is that I'm using the Force Rotation Rippers Miller Polisher to pretty much correct the entire vehicle. I think even to this day, after years of use, if I could only have one polisher and I was doing lots of single stage corrections, the Millie would still be my number one choice. It's just the fact that with its small 5mm throw, you can get really close up to panel edges and get great correction with a larger 5 or 6 inch pad. And the fact that it doesn't stall like free spinning DAs, yet is much more forgiving than a rotary in a single stage correction process, just makes it the best balance of both worlds. Now in a high end paint correction setting, I just never want to have to pick a single machine as it's virtually impossible to pursue that high level of work without multiple polishers that work best for very specific areas. But for a job like this where perfection is not being chased and time is limited, it's just a fantastic machine in this scenario or even as one machine of many in a higher end correction setting. I guess something else to discuss here would be technique and method. Although single stage corrections can save a lot of time in not having to do additional polishing stages, they are also less forgiving in that you only have one shot or stage to get it right. So with a force rotation polisher, that means you can angle it in a little to get some increased levels of defect removal in tighter spots. But then you have to level it back down and keep it perfectly flat to the surface in order to get the best possible finish. So even though you're just doing a single set, you can in certain areas treat the first half of that set as your cutting stage with some angling and even increased machine speeds and pressure. But then you have to finish that set by using more gentle techniques in order to finish with good gloss and clarity levels. Another really important factor is the pads themselves. I love these Rupes yellow wool pads, but if I'm being honest, they don't tend to have the best durability. So making sure that you have enough pads and that they're still in good condition from start to finish is absolutely vital or your results will start to suffer. Another point here would be to clean as you go. It's simply hard not to get compound residue into panel edges and trims when you're using a single larger polisher to do the whole vehicle. When compound residue and the surface itself is still warm, it's far easier to remove. But when that residue and the surface cools down, it hardens and just becomes more difficult to clean off. So cleaning as you go can be a more efficient and effective way to go in that case. I guess one final point to mention will be the thing about not chasing higher end results is that you don't have to fuss over every little defect or pursue the best possible gloss and clarity levels. Now that doesn't mean it's okay to leave most defects in place or leave a horrible hazy finish behind, but it does mean that if it's a good improvement and finish, you've done a good appropriate job and fussing over every little tight edge or defect just isn't possible with a limited time and budget frame. Well guys, that's just about it for part two of the detail on this Mitsubishi Pajero Bush Basher series. I hope you stay tuned for part 3 and the final chapter where I'll be dressing and sealing the finish as well as showing you guys the final finish results. If you enjoyed this video and would like to say thanks and help support future content, you can do so by buying me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash ccad in which I'll have a link to in the description box and thank you everyone for the support so far. As always, I really hope you guys enjoyed and found this video useful. Please give it a like, share it with others and comment below to show your support for this content and I'll see you guys soon.